Welcome to this Times Techies webinar. I'm Akhil George and I have with me my colleague Sujit John. The two of us will moderate the discussion that we are having in partnership with IBM. Our discussion today is on responsible AI. The role of AI in Indian businesses has been expanding significantly. Algorithms are influ influencing tactical planning, resource allocation, and customer engagement. The complexity of this AI-driven decision-making has also given rise to the concept of uh, responsible AI, which promotes the principles of transparency, accountability, fairness, and privacy. In this webinar, we will discuss responsible AI and its significance for India's fundamental industries, such as banking and pharmaceuticals, as well as, as, well as discuss the roadmap that companies can follow for its effective adoption. And for this discussion, we have two highly accomplished professionals. We have with us Deeraj Sinha. Deeraj is Executive Vice President and Global CIO at Sun Pharma. He joined Sun Pharma earlier this year. Prior to this, he was with JSW as EVP and Group Chief Information Officer for more than eight years. And before that, he was with the he was the Group CIO and Global Ch Supply Chain Head with Apollo Tires for over twelve years. Welcome, welcome, Deeraj. Thank you. Thanks, Akhil. Thanks for the warm welcome. And we have Rishi Arora. Rishi has been on this platform before. He's managing partner for IBM Consulting India and South Asia. He leads the organization's strategy and go to market. He has over 25 years of experience. In his most recent years, Rishi provided advisory and solutions to India's financial services industry and helped transform several major banks and financial institutions into future ready organizations. Welcome, Rishi. Thank you. Those who are viewing this can send in questions through the Facebook comment box. Uh, Akhil and I will put them to Dheeraj and Rishi. Dheeraj can ask you this first. Uh, pharma, of course, is one of India's most fundamental and core industries with all the technology advancements that have happened. Can you give us a quick glimpse into two, three major changes that AI has brought into your sector or is bringing into your sector? And while you're saying that, you can also say something about the kind of impact Gen AI has made. Sure. So let me let me start uh, from the pharma sector background as well. So I think pharma by itself is is slightly behind the curve as far as, and I'm not talking specific company, but as an industry, I think uh, because of the fragmented nature in which the solutions have been developed over and, and deployed over a period of time, and the fact that all pharma companies have been built on top of acquisitions. And you have a very, very heavy regulatory framework that's there, which doesn't allow you or give you the speed and flexibility or agility to be able to move forward. So, so I when when I put the when I answer the question, I'll answer it in this context. Now, there are multiple use cases as far as AI is concerned, and uh, we have done quite a lot of POCs and we are now very firmly on the path in terms of our AI journey. So starting with pharmacovigilance, there are multiple, as you would be aware that for every molecule or drug that we discover, we, the moment it gets into the market, you have to have a pharmacovigilance in terms of what are the side effects of the drug on a given patient. If you have a core morbidity or if you have, for example, diabetes and you are taking a tablet, then there are certain prescriptive things, there are certain side effects, etc. that you need to be aware of. Now, you can get it in a solicited manner, which is if a patient gets in, he's expected to report, but in India, no one does it. Uh, you can go back to the to the, to the the doctor who had prescribed you the medicine and say that you are feeling dizzy and hence you need to change. The doctor also does not report. So then there are unsolicited methods because there are a lot of journals, etc., where this molecule and its interaction with various other molecules etc., are all listed. There are multiple such publications which are available. And hence, you need to ensure that you are prescribing the right set of um, uh, side effects, etc. If you notice the box in the, any pharma, uh, pharma package, there's a small chit that comes out with side effects. Do not drink and drive and do not do this and... And if you are pregnant, don't use this, etc., etc., etc. Now, all this by regulatory, there's a mandate that you need to ensure that you refresh these every period of time. Now, there is a battery of people who work to be able to get this information in from various crawlers, search, etc. Put it to our doctors in terms of these are what the new side effects that have been discovered globally. 
and then this prescription either is said that we are standardizing it and it will remain as it is or it needs to change now this is a intensely manual work by regulation if you do 10000 drugs you can understand the kind of work that is there in terms of periodically scanning understanding and doing it so one of the very simple use cases for jni to be able to scribble get put it in a pamphlet in a standard format and you are done with it uh, in terms of regulatory filings for example you do a lot of regulatory filings when you do a drug discovery in terms of in various global markets whether it's uh, fda whether it's canada health australia health indian ministry etc all of them now the same molecule and the same scientific data that we have got all the formats are different for every drug regulatory authority and then you need to go ahead do copy paste there are multiple things that you do to be able to then subscribe and ensure that you are able to at least file the drug again so there are lots of inefficiencies in the entire process as we speak and uh, while we say whatever pharma so i come from an industry which was which was core manufacturing completely uh, <laughs> and from there when i come and see the pharma industry i think uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do to bring it up at scale there are lots of brilliance that we have done but we have done it in pockets for use cases we have not looked at it from a platform perspective to say boss this is how and that's the change that we are now attempting to bring to be able to put it on a platform centric approach rather than a use case based approach so use case based approach has its own utility in terms of scaling up etc and once you have defined it you will have again a spread of various use cases etc that you would have serving certain things you'll never get a combined uh, combined intelligence that you need out of the enterprise information that you have so i can continue to talk about in csv validations in computer whatever that we do we need to get a lot of regulatory compliances done now there are 17 format that you need to fill for every csv which is a computer system validation that you need to do so i think ai gen ai the ml language modeling that we need to do in drug discovery i think there are enormous benefits that are there and we are just touching the tip of the iceberg as we speak the pharmacovigilance example that you gave uh, what, what is exactly gen ai looking at uh, all that so you would so one is for simple for example from a python it will look at all of these that come in then it would look at all the regulatory because you need the uh, the link from where you had picked up this information from you would concise put them together in a format which is which is a, a 200 word or 500 word or 1000 word depending on whatever it is concise put it up together put it in a format that's there and then it then gets presented to the doctor and then it goes into an approval cycle and whatever that he needs to do okay okay also been hearing about this uh, with among the thousands of molecules to kind of narrow down on uh, the better ones are likely uh, good ones and all that <laughs> those are possible so, is it yeah absolutely so in terms of drug discovery your ability ai can help you accelerate your pipeline uh, in terms of finding the right target, who can be the right target, what is the right medicine or the vaccine, and then who is the right patient, etc. So your ability to get the research done, typically it's a five-year process. And we are saying with, with whatever adoption that we can do, we'll be able to at least cut it down by one, one year to one and a half years. So yeah. we can bring it down to three and a half to four years. Wow. And summarization I, of research and all that is also is something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In a sense, there are three stages of clinical research before that you do it on animals, etc., etc., to be able to arrive. And then you put in an application and when you get an early discovery done, then is when you get into three phases of clinical trials. So at every stage of the process is a enormous amount of documentation gets done. I think uh, we are now sick of the documentation that happens <laughs> in the industry. So... There's a lot of tooling that can be enabled to be able to help the R&D folks, the regulatory folks, etc., to be able to perform whatever they are performing much better and more efficiently and possibly more accurately as well. Are you using it right now to uh, for drug discovery? That's what I said. We are using spots and bril of brilliance that's there, uh, oh. but it is specifically for use cases currently. 
it is not so our ability to leverage it and bring it to an enterprise scale is something that we are working on because you understand the sales data you can work only around the sales thing now to be able to bring that data and relate it with the manufacturing data or with the supply chain data or with the and i'm taking a general enterprise example you will have to integrate it together to be able to get certain context and value out of it otherwise sales ka everything the super ai on sales is currently working it gives all the nudges that it needs but the ability for me to be able to bring it and do it along with the supply chain to understand as to for this customer did it reach in time and what is the otp etc what are the kind of drug that he has been ordering etc and whether he has been getting it at the at the right time so all those things typically you need an enterprise scale data architecture to be in place to be able to do that that's current work that's in progress very interesting lots of use cases uh, rishi tell us i mean i mean uh, subject of today uh, i know across indian business there's now a realization that adoption of ai comes with risks and challenges can you tell us some uh, what are these risks and challenges and why is ai governance through a responsible ai framework being spoken about as a viable solution just before i start deep uh, dheeraj fascinating yeah. to hear you yeah the <laughs> use cases which were playing in my mind when we when you talk about you know different countries different forms to be filled around automation around accuracy right it was really fascinating to you know, so rishi i think uh, so we have discussed in the past as well and i think there's a lot of enterprise help that the industry needs forget forget the company yeah. the industry needs to be able to refrog and i sincerely believe that pharma is slightly behind the curve in terms of when you look at automotive etc where i worked in the past i think there's there's a lot of work that we need to do to to bring it to absolutely 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 you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, Sujit, you spoke about responsible AI. You spoke about AI governance, right? You spoke about uh, challenges, right? Let me start by saying, let me start by data, right? What does the data say? IBM continuously does uh, research, right? We have uh, we have IBM's Institute of uh, Business Value, and when we talk to execs, uh, you know, like uh, Dheeraj, right? We talk to execs across the industry. Seventy-one percent of those execs believe. for successful adoption of uh, ai right for successful adoption of ai ai governance is a must otherwise ai will not uh, succeed right and that's a very strong uh, uh, that's a very strong uh, data point another very important aspect which uh, dheera spoke about enterprise wide ai right see year 2023 was a year of we doing a lot of proof of concepts we doing a lot of pilots right but how many of those pilots if you go and analyze how many of those pilots have actually converted into real uh, you know use cases which are giving a return of investment uh, to enterprises right ai is not about one use case here and there ai is about adoption at an organization level at an enterprise level and now let me talk about you know what is actually hampering this right according to me there are three or four parts which are really hampering the progress of ai one you know organizations have embarked on their data programs right see what feeds into ai uh, data feeds into ai right so organizations need to have a very robust data architecture and especially so in today's environment right data is spread across we call multi cloud hybrid private public data is uh, spread across organization across right on prem on cloud so having a very robust data architecture becomes extremely important for a good ai program right and by a good ai program i mean adoption of ai in an enterprise right so the first challenge is basically data get your data architecture sorted the next one if you go back a few years you know who was recruiting gen ai skills right we were not even there was not a there was yes automation has been there for a long time but who was recruiting gen ai skills right i can i have gone across the industry see so first you have to start by what is a jd of a gen ai skill right what is a job description so basically it's all about you know reskilling upskilling your workforce right you have to equip them those are going to be your 
ambassadors of change right they are going to adopt they are going to ensure that your organization goes through that change and adopts ai right so skill is the second challenge today and this is not an easy job to be fair uh, you know reskilling and upskilling people or retraining is a job which is cost in intensive it is also time consuming right so the organizations need to have the right priorities right if gen ai if the return of investments across an enterprise are you know are there to be taken then let's start investing on having the having the right people to do the job right so skill is the second challenge uh, which you know which organizers organizations are facing and again i'm saying i'm just reiterating uh, just repeating what dheeraj said at an enterprise level i'm not talking of one poc year or two pocs i'm talking at enterprise level so that's that's number 2 number 3 see you are going by these gen ai algorithms gen ai models right how do you trust the output how do you really trust the output right it's you know it cannot be a black box right today most of the gen ai models are uh, you know neither their provenance is really known what is their source second is their testing has happened on you know i would say unknown data right so how do you really you know how do you really trust that data so for organizations right to ensure that the models can be trusted you know data provenance the models being trained on data which is known becomes very important right see if you don't know the provenance of data or if you don't know uh, you know the data set on which these uh, algorithms are trained it can create huge challenges it can create challenges around pii compliance right there is there are regulations coming in our country on pii it can create challenges around uh, you know it can create legal challenges most important it can create trust issues right basically it will create so, health challenges in our cases <laughs> in pharmaceutical industry how do, you know he was talking about the drugs being uh, you know the drugs right. being authorized or uh, you know basically certified if i can uh, say that you need to for that the data is even more important right because end of the day you are dealing with lives of people for financial services industry you are dealing with monies of uh, people right so again having you know have, you cannot have any biases you cannot have any uh, you know you cannot have any kind of uh, data which is not you know which what is going into your uh, algorithm you have to know that right so and that's where i believe right so if i if i then again just have to talk about three i spoke about uh, data architecture i spoke about trust i spoke uh, i spoke about skills right so how do we now solve for it right see ai i i also said that ai governance is extremely important right uh, chief execs believe that uh, without ai governance nothing will you know uh, ai programs will not be successful so how do we really solve for this what is this uh, ai governance we keep talking about it it is nothing but a framework which basically are guardrails if i can you know if i can uh, call them that on how ai programs should basically run in an organization in ibm right we have our own uh, you know ai platform watson right uh, we we have you know we call these uh, guardrails right for responsible ai as pillars of trust and what are these you know what are these pillars of trust according to us there are you know there are five uh, pillars of trust one is about explainability i just spoke about how important uh, data is right what data is going into the algorithm you basically need to be able to explain it right what is the data going it is you know it cannot be garbage in garbage out kind of models right so it's all about uh, you know it's all about uh, explainability fairness i spoke about uh, you know fairness is all about having no biases right you cannot have any biases in data your ai models will not be trusted so it's all about uh, explainability fairness number 3 most important when you are building a gen ai models at an enterprise level they have to scale up right 
So these models have to then be robust. And what I mean by robustness is basically they have to withstand any external threat which is coming in, cyber attacks, right? Their architecture should be such that they can scale and withstand any kind of a security attack which is, uh, you know, which is uh, kind of coming in. So robustness uh, becomes, uh, again, uh, very, very important. Privacy. We don't want our data to be, you know, if I say, firstly, I don't want my data uh, to just be, uh, you know, just be, uh, uh, just be used by anyone, right? With the privacy norms coming in our country, privacy is extremely important. So privacy is another uh, very important uh, pillar of trust. And finally, I will call transparency. When I'm looking at an output of a model, right? How can I explain? Suppose I'm working with Dheeraj, right? And we have worked on, you know, on one of the use cases which Dheeraj was, Dheeraj was uh, talking about. I should be able to explain to him how the output has been uh, derived at, right? Absolutely transparent, right? Okay, these are the data sets which uh, went in. This is the functionality. And this is the output which has been uh, derived of the model. So according to me, uh, these five uh, pillars of trust, as we uh, call it, right? And uh, we use it in, like I said, in our IBM zone, uh, Watson dot uh, governance uh, model or Watson dot governance platform. They form the basis of successful and responsible AI adoption in an organization. Yeah. Back to you, Suji. Okay. Okay. So basically, you're ensuring, uh, I mean, what are these? The, the framework itself includes uh, how to do uh, when you're doing a data engineering and all of that, how exactly you do it. Are there also technologies that you're talking about? What is it, the framework? You see, whenever, whenever, what is, again, when we talk about AI, AI is not only technology. Let's be very clear about it. AI is about people, process, and uh, technology. All of it, Right. So when we are designing AI pro programs, how do we use these guardrails or these pillars of trust, as I call it, at the time at the time of not only design, at the time of not only build, so design, build, deploy, but most importantly, at the time of use, right? So how do we use these guardrails at the time of design, build, deploy, and use? And this is a continuous uh, process, right? Because models keep evolving over uh, you know over time those principles are something which we need to kind of take care of at the time of embarking on these uh, gen ai programs okay and are those principles uh, standard is that a lot of experimentation involved uh... we have we have been using these uh, principles watson x is a world leading uh, uh, solution right so we have been using these principles and again we believe in uh, responsible ai so the output which you get about get uh, from our model uh, no uh, uh, no from a, from an engineering perspective what does that look like is it very difficult to make sure that you know that uh, your ai models are free of bias for example what does that actually entail uh, are there any specific skill sets uh, uh, techniques Sorry, I'm, I'm what is it getting your question but anyways i will try and answer it your yeah, question is very general but see these models are you have to continuously train these uh, models yeah you have to continuously train these uh, uh, models right and there are principles you need to follow which i just spoke about right there are three or four elements in an ai program one I spoke about, and you know the uh, you know basically the algorithms and the models which you have uh, basically uh, written to to give you the output. Second is about the data which will derive the output in the models, right? And uh, third is how do you govern the data and the you know how do you govern the data and uh, these uh, models or algorithms to continuously give you. Uh, you know, output at scale and output which is uh, trusted, right? So it's a it's a pretty structured program, uh, you know, which you embark uh, upon. Okay, let me okay. let me attempt to add yes. to what he had said. So, for example, you have you have tons and tons of data that comes in. Now, with the lineage etc., you would understand that this data 
typically is a data of Indian nationals, US nationals. If you're sending it globally, this percentage is India, this percentage is US, etc. The data has the capability to be able to summarize and hence your ability to visually say that there is a bias. Since 90% of the data is a US centric data, for example, hence your bias is, so it would visibly show it. Obviously, correct. you would not be able to correct because your data is not there for anyone else. But it would visually tell you that this is a US centric data or this is US centric female related data or male related data and so on. Absolutely. So your tendency to get bias is reflected as a score. I have not seen the Watson X platform, but I've seen other platforms where this bias, etc., what you were asking, typically is made more visual and uh, and informative in terms of whatever the Jenny I does. It also gives you links, et cetera, to be able to say a, a tabulated data, 80% this, 20% this, et cetera, so that you have the output and you have the base data behind it to be able to give it to you. And links to the various information set. So that helps in terms of understanding as to whether there's a bias. Or not. Okay, it's yeah, about yeah. trusting the data set. See, data set, on what data is your model trained, right? <laughs> if you don't know that data set, if it, like I said, if it is unknown, right? How do you really trust the output of that data set, <laughs> right? So organizations today embark, organizations, yes, some bit of uh, unknown, but they embark on Gen AI programs using their own curated data sets where, you know, where you have to, like Dheeraj rightly said, it's all about removing biases, right? Removing, if I can talk about hate, right? How do you remove all of that so that you can then trust the output what you are uh, really getting? Yeah, and there is a structure to all of this madness if I can talk about how do you embark on this program? There are steps, like I said, it's about design. How do you design these programs? How do you follow these principles when you are, uh, you know, when you are in the phase of build and deploy? And most important, according to me, is the use phase, right? Because this is not that one time you have run the model and that's the end of it. That's just the start of your entire cycle. Yeah. Hope I could answer your uh, yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely. Dheeraj, tell us, I mean, uh, all that Rishi said about uh, AI governance, this must be really important for pharma. I'm sure it's quite different from your previous job at JSW. Uh, so give us an idea, I mean, how are you approaching AI governance in your organization and what have you seen in other parts, yeah, other sure. contemporaries? So I think biopharma is, has a greatest strategic opportunity for AI, AI, ML and Gen AI. And hence, there is a huge amount of responsibility that's also comes and being the number one player in the industry, in our geography, at least the responsibility is on us as leaders to be able to go to responsive and um, responsible ai now to be able to reach there uh, there is a there's a lot of discussion that's happening internally to be able to set up a, a governance council which comprises it digital compliance legal and regulatory so these five people will sit together and that's the council that's getting formed and Every and he Rishi talked about bias and how is it that you can find out, etc. Extremely important. Uh, so what we are now creating is a is a complete mesh architecture where the data lineage, the data governance, data quality, the stewards of quality, etc., all are getting defined as part of an organization. And hence, when a data comes in in our data lake, we would know the lineage, we'll know from which source is it coming from, etc. And for everything that you get, you would get a small box which says this is the this is the lineage of data. It's coming from our S enterprise SAP, it's coming from success factor, it's coming from this, that, these, those. And this is the time of ingestion that it came in from. So you have that structure now being built. Now, once that structure is built, I think that's the foundation. And while Rishi also mentioned why are the POCs not successful. Uh, we have lots of POCs, but in terms of enterprise scaling, there are very few that get scaled up to an enterprise to realize the benefits. And I think that the, the method in madness is to get the data architecture correct. Otherwise, you will have POCs, your ability to scale up 
typically may get, I'll not say does get, but may get limited in terms of how efficiently can you drive it. The ability to do correlation across typically you will never be able to do unless until you have got the data at a place where either you do it in place or you take it to a data lake, whichever way. All technologies are available for us to be able to look at. But coming back to your question, in the pharma domain, we we deal with the lives of people. We People take medicine because there is a problem and they want help. <clears throat> now, this is all the AI that you go ahead and do. If you give it a wrong prescription, etc., then there is a there is a potential for health hazard other than regulatory, legal, etc. that can happen in any case. So I think from an industry point of view, we as a pharma industry, it poses a greater amount of responsibility on us to be able to use it uh, in a more responsible way than any other industry would. Uh, so your the as, as Rishi mentioned, the ability to get the PII information. So we get how is it that the model can hide that PII information and not blurt it out and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, what are the kind of patient issues that are there has to be generic in nature and cannot be specific in nature. Uh, it cannot start by giving examples etc. from a gen point of view. Uh, uh, how is it that I can stop biases from happening? And it's easier said than done while there are technologies available. But at best, it can only show you. I have not seen a competing technology that will stop biases from happening. Uh, and the fact that it can amount to a lot of misinformation. It has a potential to generate a lot of wrong information and it goes into the right hands as wrong information, then you have a potential of disaster. Uh, combining all of this while we are building, building our AI architecture at scale, we are also looking at creating all these guardrails, as Rishi calls it, to be able to Every Gen AI use case model, etc., will go through. It has not yet gone through, so it's still under construction, but will possibly go through the legal, regulatory, IT, and digital as one set. It has to be presented to that set. So these are the manual guardrails, if I can look at them. The ability to get into a Watson X dot uh, generative or whatever, whatever issue is talking about in terms of tool sets that you would need. I think we are still approximately half a year to a year away to able to get to tools because once we get into an enterprise scale across the enterprise, uh, not only in R&D, not only in sales, not only in supply chain, not only in HR, but the moment there are, as we speak, there are roughly around 87 use cases that we already have. But we have said we will not go use case based. We'll go the platform approach base because use case base uh, you do it, uh, it, it is bound to lead to certain issues. So on a platform-based approach, I think the moment we have our data architecture ready, the ability to spun use cases would be much simpler, faster, and possibly much more responsible in terms of the way that we see them and the way that we get there. And then the ability to insert at an appropriate time the a, a solution for guard railing and biasing or non-bias, etc. would also make it architecturally more simpler for us. Our challenge in the industry is about discrete systems, plants having their own sets of systems, local deployments, etc., which is a challenge that we are trying to overcome. And any deployment that now happens is only a central deployment, etc., etc., etc. And I can talk about that as well. So that's the quick, uh, quick response from a pharma industry. And I'm very clear that as an industry leader, we will have to take a lead in terms of not only not only doing it, but whatever we preach, we have to practice it, and then also show the show the part to the other industry fraternity of us. So till this platform is ready, you are, the use cases won't start, or you are simultaneously working on some use cases. Uh, that, that's a very interesting question that the board is also. How long do we need to wait? <laughs> <laughs> and the quickness is in terms of doing it. So what we have said is we have picked up priority use cases. So there are seven of them that we have picked up where the data mapping, etc. a lot of work needs to be done. It's not about bringing it into the data lake and then everything will happen. So a lot of pre-work that needs to happen has already started happening. So what was already running as part of an isolated use cases are running. We are not disturbing them. Those are what I was called the spots of excellence that are there. 
but going on now for an enterprise scale for regulatory affairs for r and d etc we have picked up seven or eight use cases that we are working on for that there are multiple data sources which needs to come in so what sets of data what fields what data needs to come in the mapping of that data if i need to create a data pipeline with these 10 systems i need to create data pipeline these are the subset of information that i need and i need 3 years information 5 years information whatever that information time frame would be that mapping in any case is needed because you would have a data lake what do you populate it with you can't populate it with everything and then start so those priority use cases are the first ones that we will get realized uh, at an enterprise scale and then we will obviously move forward and do uh, do whatever else is necessary so that's the that's okay. the quick answer yeah okay uh, Rishi, uh, what's your advice to companies that are planning to deploy a responsible AI framework? So, you know, you spoke about just to add on this use cases, right? Akhil? See, use cases, according to us, as per the research which we have uh, done, right? The use cases are, are around IT, you know, in terms of migration, automation, our kind of, uh, you know, we see that there is a lot of potential. Use cases around risk management, Dheeraj alluded uh, to it, right? Across industries, if I have to talk about uh, uh, financial services or, you know, Dheeraj spoke about how do you, uh, you know, how do you ensure that, uh, you know, if the medicines we are taking are, you know, are completely, uh, you know, completely safe, right? So you have to go through a huge process. So use cases around the entire risk management piece are, are, are proven according to me use cases around talent transformation right uh, around hr right there is a huge potential use cases around fna finance and operations so these are use cases around customer service basically the uh, front end right so organizations can you know i'm not saying that you come when we say enterprise level or enterprise wide i'm not saying go and deploy everything everywhere no if there are use cases around tech or if the organizations believe customer service is an area which we need to you know sort for right and there are real benefits the roi needs to be very clear it's not about it's not a tick in the box uh, exercise that i have deployed uh, gen ai the roi needs uh, the roi needs to be established and the roi needs to be uh, followed on yeah well, organizations, so my my advice, and I talk to a lot of organizations across uh, industries on embarking uh, about, on embarking on these programs. A lot of people talk about models or algorithms. A lot of people uh, talk about data, but I always start with governance, right? You say that you have established the ROI. You have established, for example, I need to do FNA, right? How do you really govern that? How do you govern that to success, if I can say that, right? So you always start with, you know, you start with governance, right? And governance has uh, two elements to it. One is basically automated AI governance. And what I uh, mean by automated AI governance, there are tools, technologies, platforms, uh, which will alleviate the manual errors, right? See these manual errors and Dheeraj also spoke about it. Imagine that because of a error, you know, there is something which is published or something which goes out in the market. You can imagine the repercussions to your, you know, to your reputation. So how do you really manage the risk and the reputation per se, right? So you, you know, these platforms, automated platforms will elevate all these kind of manual errors. So that is, that is the technology part. I said before, AI has elements of uh, people, AI has elements of process, AI has elements of technology right all of it has to uh, come together then it is about so this is automated ai governance then it is about organization ai governance what is organization ai governance what i mean by that right it's not for example if dheeraj has embarked on an ai program it is not only his responsibility right to ensure that uh, the program will be successful right you need to have for example a center of excellence you need to have a ethics ai board and i purposely use the word ethics uh, ai uh, you know ai board right so you need to have an organization set up which will and this is all at the beginning right all at the start of these programs how will you measure success 
how will you ma uh, measure, uh, you know, how will you go through the change, right? So this is right at the start of the program. The organization should support uh, this program because, you know, like I said, all departments or all functions uh, will be impacted. Yeah. So when you have, when you have, then, you know, when you have embarked on it, we already spoke a lot about uh, data, right? Uh, what data will go into your AI models, right? For example, if I again talk about the technology which we have, Watson X, we don't, we allow, you know, we allow organizations to get their own curated data sets. By curated, I mean known data sets. And they can use, uh, you know, and they can self-service basically the, uh, the data models, right? So we allow organizations to do that. Not only, we also, you know, as IBM, we also curate these uh, data sets and remove any biases because only then the models uh, will be successful, right? So what's an X dot data or basically data uh, becomes a very important part of any AI program. I spoke about governance. I, you know, I, uh, you know, I spoke about data then it is all about adoption and measuring success, right? So in the sense, what, according to me, what gets, uh, what, what, uh, what really can get measured will be uh, successful, right? So through, again, through the governance, uh, um, through the governance aspects of AI, how do you really measure, uh, you know, how do you really measure success, right? Mm -hmm. What is the output or what is the outcome which has uh, basically, uh, been, you know, basically been uh, delivered. So my advice to organizations primarily is on, you know, basically start with, you know, the benefits which you will derive, right? Don't think small, think enterprise wide or by enterprise wide, I mean, think at least a function wide. Where do you want to deploy uh, these uh, programs? There has to be a clear ROI, have very clear view on, uh, you know, very clear view on data because otherwise you will never reach success and then it is all about continuous uh, measurement using ai you know using ai governance i already spoke about uh, you know for i already spoke about uh, the challenges so you have to circumvent those challenges i think data we all spoke about skills right people is a very important aspect they are the people who can derive this right you cannot just have Okay, tomorrow you start doing, you know, AI, that will not, so you <laughs> need to have some structured programs of where people can start, uh, you know, adopting these new uh, technologies, right? And we already spoke a lot about responsible AI. So I just wanted to stress on the people and the talent point a bit, right? Because without which you may have the best of tools, you may have the best of intentions, but if you don't have, uh, if you don't have that skill in your organization, right? How will you really embark on it? I also tell uh, I also tell organizations that uh, you know go with trusted partners. Basically, you know people who have uh, done this many times uh, before, right? Co-build it, co-develop it, right? Don't try and you know don't try and do everything on your on your own, right? Because you need to leverage the experience which is already there <clears throat> in the industry, right? Go with uh, trusted partners. Who have who have been part of this journeys uh, many times over, right? That's how you curate a successful AI uh, program. So, Dheeraj, you have COEs and AI ethics board, and have you thought of no, no, ROI so I, and all of that? <laughs> so, I said we are in the process of forming, and it takes awesome. time because you need to get a conviction going. You need to bring all the leaders on board, etc. And you need to emphasize the importance, and as Rishi was saying, that it's a collective responsibility. And uh, I very firmly believe that in any digital transformation as we speak, 50% is about culture. And the change technology is only 20 to 30%. The rest of them is training and management. And 50% is about culture, which is about spreading awareness, etc. And roping in people into your project program or whatever it is. That's awareness a very critical about spreading Sorry? awareness about spreading awareness about spreading awareness about whichever program that you're embarking upon. Okay. It is about change management. How would it happen for you, your life, your your day as to how would it happen? Absolutely. What are the new changes? Yeah. It's about culture. If you do not get into that, it would uh, it's a, it's a misnomer. I'm also pointing it out that possibly like 
in the pharma tray we have gxp good manufacturing practices good quality everything is about about gxp in a compliance framework etc uh, we are talking in the industry about a good ml practice g gmlp gxp man we are also getting a gmlp into it uh, and it is advocated by a lot of big players in the innovation space but uh, if there is an industry guideline and a regulation which is there because otherwise it will become a huge roadblock for the pharma industry to be able to get into a drug discovery and then find you cannot use it because certain regulations you would you would not be able to comply with so if there are guidelines and regulations in the pharma industry that come right up front for us it would be extremely helpful to be able to align arrive and then from from the start when we are embarking on it like, like, okay explain that again and who should do it the indian regulator or the global the, regulator the global there is nothing called an indian regulator it's a it's a general gxp practice a good manufacturing practice it is it comes from an fda european commission etc so there's a so there's a lot of industry might that is going on in terms of getting a gmlp also released so that at least we know what the guidelines are and we are not contravening any of the guidelines that are listed what you don't know obviously you don't know and hence uh, it's very simple for you to get caught on the wrong foot okay. and what rishi said about uh, having partners uh, how, how much are you doing in house have you uh, you think you are building a team in house but you also will partner with companies like ibm is it so, so we are so ibm is one of the critical partners even otherwise and we we work with rishi very closely but uh, having made that comment i think um, what we are attempting to do is a is a boot model we will build the partner will build the partner will start the start the operationalize it set it up when we start realizing the benefit we'll get something to be in source back to because we don't want to perennially depend on the partner and at the same point of time certain coes gets built so that they become part of the program right at the start and they also embark embark and continue to get skilled on the on the program as we go along so it's a twin approach that we would adopt but to start with we think it will be partner led and over a period of time it will it will become internal led and partner supported rather than the uh, other way around which is the current way correct so right? architecture about, that you're building I, is currently it's all about code development right in the sense uh, end yes. of the day the change part of it the culture part of it uh, will need to be owned by the organization obviously <laughs> yeah and that to me is the mission for success okay so i'm asking so this initial architecture and all that you are building you said is uh, ibm is helping very closely with all of that is it correct okay okay anything else uh, akhil um what type of uh, roles what type of skills do you need uh, uh, for your project team that you know has to take care of this kind of ai governance framework and all what are the most uh, important skills so let me let me attempt to answer this and i think i leave it to the expert like rishi to be able to answer the rest so i think what we are looking at is the data science the people who understand data and able to make sense out of data these are typically statisticians etc who work on data models to be able to derive so there are certain people that we have recruited and there are more that we are recruiting uh being in the clinical research etc the biostatisticians we have many uh people who do sample sizing understanding what is the sample size what is the patient size etc and they work on saas platforms etc so we have a inherent advantage of getting the right data scientist internally to be able to also help uh but we are taking help but there is core data scientists that we are recruiting some of them are already there in we are also recruiting people with cloud tech so agar bedrock pe karna or if you want to do it on open ai etc the first is the step is the ability to understand all the nuances at a cloud level in terms of doing it so it is the tech architecture from a cloud point of view a uh, data architecture and governance is something that's internal to us that we are doing creation of pipelines is what we are putting it out with the partners help to be able to understand uh, how is it that you suck data and how do you create pipeline and how do you understand the lineage 
of data and whatever that I spoke about. So there is a COE that is getting set up as we speak. It is in progress. There are certain numbers that we have already decided that this would be what the size of the COE would be if we need to do these 35, 40 engagement that use cases that we wanted to start with. Subsequent to this, the moment you set it up in the data architecture space, please understand that it will all mushroom and there'll be hundreds of use cases. You prove 10 use cases at an enterprise scale and you'll have hundreds of people coming to you with use cases. Now that's where some we would leverage with the partners help to be able to get these skills, expertise, etc. that is needed to be able to take it at scale again. So a partner is, how should I put it, is a very, very necessary ingredient in this entire space because the expertise skills, and he has done it multiple number of times and multiple other customers and understand the pitfalls that are there. So for me, getting to know the pitfalls and what you should not do, I think it has more value for me uh, in terms of getting a prescriptive language that this is what you should be doing. So these two and three things are what we are attempting to do, setting up a COE ourselves with data scientists, cloud architects, and the data architecture and engineering modelers. That's the first piece along with the partner. We are working on it to get it set up. And then we will add certain skill sets, continue to add, but we would obviously in the initial phases, I'll say for the first two, two and a half years, we'll be extremely reliant on the partner. And subsequently, we would see a straw that, that we bring their skills internally. First, we'll poach on some of the partner skills as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, that because they are the ones who understand, who have done the building blocks, etc. So that's the contractually, that's how we would want to structure it to be able to then then get them to be able to help. How, how big do you think your team will become? So I, I it's a public forum, so I would <laughs> okay. I would not like to comment on it, but I think sure. it's a pretty substantial number. I see. Okay. Rishi, what on that skills part? If I, if I just to, uh, you know, add on, uh, Thira spoke about data, he spoke about cloud. I will talk about, uh, you know, deep technical and functional expertise to first define, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, what use cases, right? In the sense, what are the outcomes we are finally uh, you know, what are the outcomes we are trying to get, right? Obviously, data scientists or statisticians become an important aspect of, you know, of this entire program. So according to me, a mix of skill, right? Technical, functional people who understand the industry uh, very well, because only then you can define those uh, algorithms. Uh, data guys basically to ensure that your data architecture is absolutely, uh, you know, absolutely in place. People who understand the platforms which are there uh, in the market who can configure uh, these platforms. For example, if I talk about Watson, people who, uh, you know, basically can, it's not about, it's all about configuring. Uh, there are a lot of algorithms already uh, built into, uh, you know, into Watson. But one important skill which will uh, define a lot of success, and again, Dheeraj spoke about that, is this entire change management, right? If you, you know, who will drive, who will be the ambassador of change in your uh, organization, right? Who will, whose job is that, right? Who will just go after it whenever you get up in the morning, think about, okay, this is something which we need to uh, get done, right? So the change management uh, skill and there the ownerships, more than the skill, the ownerships need to be, uh, ownerships, r and R need to be clearly defined. It's not a one person, two person, one department job. It is an organization's job to make an AI program successful. So deep tech skills, you need uh, functional it skills. skills all of yeah. that. Absolutely. Okay. And I know we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, so, I mean, for especially for, I mean, for all companies and industries, but particularly for some of these fundamental businesses like pharma, banking, telecom, responsible AI has is absolutely critical. I mean, with AI, of course, now everybody says is going to have a phenomenal impact on all our lives or across functions in enterprises. So responsible AI is going to become very, very important. The aspects of transparency, accountability, fairness, privacy, ensuring no biases. These are fundamental and you'll have to start thinking about it right up front. That is a message from Rishi and Dheeraj. Thank you to both of you for a 
very interesting discussion, uh, Rishi Dheeraj. Really nice having you on this platform. Hope to see you again. Thank and you. Dheeraj, great. All the best with all your programs for the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Rishi. Thank Thanks, Akhil. Thank you.